Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Reopening Connecticut Arts Venues Science-Based Safety. I'm Eric Dillner, the CEO of the Shoreline Arts Alliance and the chair of this task force. The mission of our task force is to offer you the opportunity to reopen your arts venues from a public health perspective, provide a listening and sharing platform, which we are going to do full and wholeheartedly today, and help build consumer confidence through science. Our goal is to offer clarity, practical scientific advice, and an opportunity to ask questions related to your risk reduction strategies. We want you to start sending those in now. Uh, we're really gonna spend most of our day today on answering questions that come in. We will help you dive deeper into your own process, lead you to build strategies for consumer confidence, confidence and ensure success and long-term viability for you and the art sector as a whole. Together, as we've said many times, we can and will reopen and keep open arts venues with prudence and knowledge. Today, uh, we've had the pleasure of having 11,000 viewers from over 18 states and three countries join us in these webinars. We're so thank thankful for the Emily Hall Tremaine Foundation, Connecticut Humanities, and Community Foundation of Middlesex County for stepping up as major partners, along with our huge chief partner and star of the show, Yale School of Public Health. What a tremendous gift you are all giving the arts community at large. We just can't thank you enough. We encourage everyone to attend each of the webinars and follow Shoreline Arts Alliance's YouTube channel and Facebook for additional information. You may also find many resources at www.shorelinearts.org. We of course want you to share this freely and broadly with all your colleagues. I'm pleased to introduce you once again to my co-chair, Sten Vermund. Sten is the Dean of the Yale School of Public Health and he holds the Anna M. R. Lauder Chair in Public Health as well as a secondary appointment in pediatrics in the Yale School of Public of Medicine. As an infectious disease epidemiologist, Sten's research pivoted quickly, and for the last, what, 12, 13 mon months, he's been dealing with this COVID-19 emergency. Sten and his wife, Pilar, are deeply fond of cultural arts, and he is pleased to offer his advice and counsel to arts and cultural organizations. Thank you, Sten, once again, for you and your team for helping us make these tough decisions in this, in this day. I also want to thank my devoted task force. Um, today, you'll get to meet every one of them. Uh, they're ready and primed to answer a bunch of, or to ask a bunch of questions that have come in with, uh, with and from you all. So let's get started. Stan, many have asked that we have revisit safety protocols. So Stan, what has changed since we started this conversation almost a year ago? What do we know now that is different from before? And where do we see things going? Stan? You're on. Thanks, Eric. Uh, things are looking up. Uh, things are looking um, promising. Um, in the in the face of uh, um, a pandemic uh, worse than anything we've seen for a hundred years, we uh, have had uh, extraordinary success in biotechnology. We have new vaccines that um, are more effective and safer than virtually any vaccine that's ever been produced. And um, they are uh, being produced by the millions a day and being distributed by the millions a day. So um, we've entered the vaccine era of coronavirus and that's going to transform um, the circumstances for the arts. Um, the um, reality is that we don't have enough vaccine for people, as everybody on this call knows, and it's going to take us months to uh, provide enough uh, vaccine to get to that 80% 80 um, 80 uh, uh, coverage level that we think will result in what we call herd immunity, such that it drives transmission rates down to near zero. And uh, imagine if there aren't any coronavirus cases circulating, how that will make a difference for the governor's guidance for the arts and our ability to get back to normal. Um, I'm waiting for the day that we can vaccinate some of our younger performers, our younger staff, um, keep our performers safe, uh, where we can cluster people uh, who are vaccinated and, and have denser seating um, the lawyers have to guide us uh, on something like that, but the notion that uh, you would have the front of the theater um, filled with vaccinated people 
and the back of the theater filled either with unvaccinated people or vaccinated people who feel uncomfortable sitting in a densely crowded space. And uh, and that sort of circumstance, may, you know, I'm, I'm fantasizing maybe we could we could permit sort of um, 60 percent, 70 percent occupancy instead of 20 <laughs> percent. So I think we're I think we're in a place where we should be planning uh, reopening arts venues, uh, keeping vaccine um, circumstances in mind because it's a game changer. Um, uh, my wife and I are, are, are both over 65. We're both back fully vaccinated and, um, we feel completely comfortable. Um, you know, the, the notion of going to a restaurant and somebody is a little bit too close to us. We don't care anymore. <laughs> we're, we're, we're not likely to get ill. And, uh, we also are not likely to infect others, even though we are still wearing our masks and being responsible because nobody else in our community knows that we're vaccinated. So we want to be good uh, um, uh, citizens and good examples, and we want to continue follow, following the governor's guide, guidelines. But we're in a very different place. The other place where we're different is as we come into springtime, uh, coronavirus rates are declining, as one would predict. Um, uh, all of the uh, respiratory viruses are more common in the winter than in the summer. And coronavirus is no exception. Coronavirus rates dropped uh, in last spring uh, precipitously, and we had much lower rates in the summer. And then they started to rise again, and they peaked in the winter, just as, as influenza does, just as a number, a whole family of respiratory viruses, uh, enteroviruses, rhinoviruses, respiratory syncytia virus, parainfluenza virus. I could go on and on. And keep in mind that there are four coronaviruses that predate SARS back in 2003 and predate the novel coronavirus from 2019. Those four coronaviruses have been circulating in humans for decades, and they cause essentially the common cold, and all of them are more common in the winter. So we would expect as we pivot to outdoor activity that uh, coronavirus rates will continue to drop. Thank you, Stan. Um, so uh, a lot of great information. We're going to dig a little deeper into some of that as we go forward here. But you've, you've mentioned for the last year um, uh, this really important big five. Um, are they still important? Uh, you want to remind us uh, of them and, and uh, let us know what you're, what, where you are with, with your uh, five big safety. So, no, number one is uh, masking. Number two is physical distancing. Number three is... Um, uh, hand and face and surface hygiene, you know, hand washing, basically. Number four is small groups. Number five is outdoor activities or optimizing indoor air quality. You could also add number six as um, testing and contact tracing. So Stan, are, the, 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 the fun the that we're having today is the to mask or not to mask or yeah. two masks. So let's start with your, uh, your first one there. Well, I like to wear my mask. Um, I see uh, no harm in letting everybody around me know that I am concerned about their welfare and I'm masking. So if I'm an asymptomatic positive, I'm helping protect them. Now, I'm not wearing a mask to protect myself. Uh, I'm vaccinated. I'm not going to get coronavirus. If I do, it's going to be an incredibly mild case. And, um, and I, I'm masking to send a message to everybody else. So I'm going to keep masking. And I'm going to keep masking until the governor tells me not to, because the governor, we say the governor, but that symbolizes uh, a whole raft of experts who are advising the Department of Public Health, including a number of people um, in, in the Yale School of Public Health, including myself and a number of my colleagues. So this is a consensus of experts. So when we say the governor, that's what it represents. And, um, and um, you know, at the end of the day, we need much better vaccination rates for us to feel sanguine about abandoning the classic public health protection measures, because we still have coronavirus. We still have people dying of coronavirus every single day. And therefore, we need to maintain some um, prudence in uh, the use of classic public health measures. You, in one of our site visits recently, you shared with us why double masking is a good thing. Uh, 
about the fit. Could you could you help us share with the others? So um, if you have a double ply mask and you have an excellent fit, you don't need a second mask. But it's tricky to get a, 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 an excellent fit. Um, I've had to trim my beard down so that my entire beard fits within my mask. A lot of men with beards don't want to do that. So they're not going to have a good fit. Um, if I go outside in the cold weather and I start fogging up my glasses, by definition, I don't have a particularly good fit around my nose. Um, if, 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 if I'm looking at a family member and, and they're wearing one of these surgical masks and it's sort of, it's sort of popping out at the edge, that's probably not a good fit. So if you're struggling with the fit of your mask, a good way to improve the fit is to use the second mask over the first mask. And that's sort of the way I think about it. Great, thank you. So we're gonna to move to, to hand washing and sanitizing and uh, Frank Tavera from the Palace Theater has a couple of questions for you. Frank? Hi Frank. Good morning, morning everyone, hi Stan. Um, yeah, I mean, so much has changed. We've been doing this for a year at this point and you know, hand washing, hand sanitizing, um, the virus living on um, surfaces for extended period of times. Like what has changed in, what, what have we learned over the last 12 months? Um, do we still kind of maintain this level of protocol? Can we uh, relax a little bit or do we have to be more vigilant? I think that, um... I, I think that being vigilant is not a bad idea until we drive the um, rates way, way down, and they're still too high. Um, Bridgeport Hospital had an increase in the number of cases uh, this Wednesday compared to last Wednesday. Uh, New Haven has uh, continuously had higher uh, hospitalization case numbers than the rest of the state. It's also had higher positivity numbers. Um, New London is doing much better. Uh, Greenwich is doing much better. Um, the northeast and northwest of the states are doing better. Hartford's still struggling. So, you know, there's still parts of the state that are in that sort of hot zone. Many of you have bookmarked the state map of coronavirus, and you can see that uh, last summer we had very few cities of the 168 uh, um, entities in the state, uh, we had very few that were red, and today we still have 40% of them that are red. Maybe it's 50%, I didn't, I didn't calculate, but a lot of them are still red with unacceptably high rates. So I would ask everybody on the call to maintain the uh, adherence to the um, cautionary notes that we've just highlighted, and um, I think things are going to improve a lot when we're pivoting to outdoor activity. Uh, if you're outdoors on your porch and you take off your mask, you're not putting everybody at high risk. The dilutional benefits of the great outdoors are immense. Um, uh, on the other hand, if you're singing outdoors, I would look and uh, uh, try to maintain a 12, 15 foot distancing. I wouldn't want to be next to uh, Eric Dillner, who's got an operatic voice and he's singing into my face at six feet. Uh, if he wants to sing and I'm at his house, I'd rather he be 15 feet and maybe pointing his face in the, uh, you know, in the other direction. I mean, we've got to use some common sense around uh, maintaining um, uh, a cautionary approach. But if Eric's vaccinated and I'm vaccinated and everybody in my unit is vaccinated, I don't care where he sings. He can sing right into my face and uh, we can even do a duet. <laughs> I'm not that good a singer. Well, Sam, the good news is I just got the call. I'm going to get vaccinated tomorrow. <laughs> That's brilliant. Good so for I'm you, I'm very Eric. excited. <laughs> so, well, welcome to our house in about a month. <laughs> Sounds good. Hey, hey, Stan, can I just follow up with something as well? Um, just because, I mean, there are those who believe that, you know, we, our body is built to kind of fight the antibodies. Um, and, you know, I know I have some people in my own family who will either over sanitize, over clean because they're trying to protect every surface. But are we doing anything to impact our own immune system by kind of over protecting ourselves from having no germs in our environments? Um, and what's what's that plan for the future? Um, are we doing anything about that? Well, you're borrowing a page from uh, research that I've been involved with. Uh, yeah. We've looked we've looked at uh, worms, helminths. And uh, that's that kind of thing you get from crawling around in the dirt when you're two years old and, and putting some of the dirt in your mouth, either on purpose or by accident. 
And, you know, uh, there is a strong hypothesis that um, not being exposed to worms as a child that our grandparents were exposed to uh, and not being exposed to a lot of the um, a lot of the uh, infectious agents because of our hyper hygienic environment is correlated with increased rates of asthma. And there's some evidence that that indicates that might be true. But none of that really applies to coronavirus. Coronavirus, we're in the middle of this pandemic where, um, um, you know, we've got a condition of children that's not rare, but very serious. Uh, we've, uh, you know, uh, probably about uh, one in 200 people is killed by the coronavirus. A lot more of them are end up in the hospital. We've got long-term consequences of coronavirus infection. We don't even understand it's pretty much shut down our economy. It's pretty much shut down our art scene, uh, at least the face-to-face -face type of art scene. So the consequences have been huge. I've never hyper clean cleansed my surfaces, never. Because this is a respiratory virus, I'm gonna get it 90% respiratorily. The 10% I can, I can handle with hand washing. So I've not been a big surface washer. I've been a big hand washer. And I've tried to reduce my uh, old habit of touching my face all the time. I'm a face toucher, and I, I think I've actually done reasonably well over the last year reducing the frequency of that event. So I don't think that a massive cleansing of surfaces is, is, is all that necessary. And those of you who have received a visit from me, I've told you, look, if you've got uh, a matinee on Sunday and your next show is going to be Thursday, don't do anything. You don't need to do some big sanitation of your whole theater because all the viruses are dead by next Thursday. But if you've got a matinee on Saturday at two and you've got a, an evening show at uh, seven, then yes, you're going to need to do some, some sanitizing of your surfaces. So I've always tried to be measured in my advice on, on surface hygiene. And I think if, if you're, if you're overdoing it and if you're, you know, wiping off all your mail, and if you're wiping off all your surfaces every half hour, uh, that was overkill to begin with, and I think it's overkill, especially now that rates are dropping. And by the way, when you're vaccinated, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. You're, you're not going to get coronavirus in any substantive way. You're, you're in great shape, so you're done with the hyper-hygienic, unless you're protecting children or people haven't been vaccinated yet. Thank you. That's great. great. Thank you so much, Stan. So um, John Carl from Connecticut Nonprofit Alliance has a few questions also. Ready to go. Hi, John Carl. Hi, good morning. Thank you, Stan, again. Um, <clears throat> my question is uh, regarding when, when we can start to go into large groups without masks. I mean, whether it's in a museum or concert venue or music festivals that I miss. Um, we'd like to start going maskless in groups. When do you think that can happen? I think that's a ways off, John Carl, because um, to, to, to stop wearing the masks, we need to stop the transmission. To stop the transmission, we have to get to the level of herd immunity. To get to the level of herd immunity, we've got to have enough vaccine and enough people willing to take the vaccine to hit those sort of 80% numbers. Now, historically, the Northeast has done a little bit better in public health sort of preventive measures than many other parts of our country. Uh, for 23 years, I worked in public health and pediatrics south of the Mesa-Dixon line, including uh, 11 years in, uh, in Alabama and, and, and 12 years in Tennessee. I can tell you they do not have the investments in public health or public health education, public education in general that we do in the Northeast. So I'm hoping that our, our better educated uh, populace and our um, somewhat, somewhat less paranoid political environment where we're not, we're not assuming that George Soros, Tony Fauci and Sten Vermund are in cahoots uh, with the vac with big pharma to make a lot of money, I just figured I'd throw Sten Vermund into that. <laughs> That's just a joke. You were supposed to laugh. 
but the point is um, that uh, that that you know we don't have as much of that um, conspiracy theory stuff going on as they do in other parts of the country. So if we can regionally get to that 80% um, uh, level of vaccination and we start seeing weeks go by where we have no hospitalizations for coronavirus, then I think you'll see the masks being put into the pocket. Uh, how I'm, confident, hoping, I'm hoping we'll get there by fall. How, how confident are you that we will get to 80%? I mean, it seems like I, I'm, vaccines are available, yeah. people are taking them. It's funny you should ask that because unrelated to this call, I happened to read the Kaiser Family Foundation survey that came out. Um, they they did one in September. They did one in in, De in in December. They did one in January, and they see steady progress in 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 vaccine confidence uh, in the U.S. and um, and it's not as dramatic as somebody like me or you would like to see, but. But it's steady, steady progress. So the, 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 there's a hard core of about 15%, 13 to 15% of people say, I'm not taking the vaccine under any circumstances. And that hasn't changed much. And then there's a group of about 8 or 9% saying, if you make me take it to go to school or to go to work, then I'll take it. But I'm not going to take it if you don't make me. And then the rest are, um, I'm already vaccinated, I want to get vaccinated, or I'm still thinking about it. And I honestly think the I'm still thinking about it crowd is going to come along. I really do, because a lot of the I'm still thinking about it are saying, look, I don't want to be the guinea pig for this brand new type of vaccine. And I want to see what's happening to everybody until I say yes. So when the people who got vaccinated last December are, um, are um, uh, hitting you know, May and it's six months and they got vaccinated and there's no untoward event and they're doing great and nobody's getting coronavirus of that vaccine group, then a lot of those, um, I'm gonna wait and see what happens, people are gonna be clamoring for vaccine, I think. So I'm thinking that it's gonna be a tough row to hoe for the 13, 15% who absolutely won't get vaccinated and maybe the eight to 9% who say, if you make me, I'll do it. And, and these are national statistics. And I'm gonna guess that in the Northeast, we're doing just a shade better, not quite as many, maybe instead of 13, 50% absolutely won't take it. Maybe it's nine to 10%, something like that. So I'm cautiously optimistic that in our part of the country, we can get to 80% vaccination. And by the way, I'm spending a lot of my time to make sure that we get there. I'm spending, I, I did, a, I did a, a, a national event a few days ago with corporate executives and, 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 and entertainment celebrities. Uh, for, uh, some of you are aware of the, the Creative Coalition, which uh, is, is, is an arm, if you will, of the entertainment industry, uh, out of, mostly out of Hollywood and New York of people who want to do good for the world through that organization. And they and, and Yale School of Public Health have partnered to try to get the entertainment industry more engaged. You know, if LeBron James, you know, could get a vaccine on TV, if, if, if we could have spokespersons uh, like, uh, um, uh, you know, Tom Hanks and Rita Wilson, uh, who got coronavirus, if they could come out and, and we could just, just use pop culture to, to, to advocate for vaccination, we think that could be good. That, that helped a lot for HIV testing when Magic Johnson and Elizabeth Taylor and many others, Selton John, spoke out about the merits of uh, HIV control. It de destigmatized and advertised. So I'm hoping that, and we're, we're doing a lot more than that. Trust me, we have, a new, we have a new vaccine spot that's gonna go on YouTube today, I think, that the School of Public Health developed. It's three and a half minutes. I'll give the link to Eric and it'll be on our school website. And we're hoping that these spots that are like trying to make things really easy to understand can demystify uh, things and reassure people. So a lot of us, including people who are on this call are gonna be working very hard on this issue. So let's stick with that tack here, Sten, for just a minute. We got a lot of questions that are, um, Right in that line. So 
what's the real deal? Which one should I take? Now, I don't have a choice because I'm getting Moderna tomorrow. But um, I'd love to hear uh, what you think about, about this. I also hear people saying, I'm getting sick. Which one's the best? Um, will, will it help with new strains? Can you, can you address, sure. should we just go get any vaccine so, we're offered or, or should we really be picked? The answer is absolutely you should get any vaccine you're offered. They are all terrific. The new Johnson & Johnson is a little less effective at preventing um, um, moderate illness, but it's just as effective at present, preventing serious illness. And it's a fabulous vaccine. If these are mRNA vaccines hadn't come along, I would have been singing the praises of the J&J because &J it's so much better than most vaccines. So the J&J &J vaccine is a different kind of vaccine altogether. It's what we call a live attenuated vector. So it's a, it's a, a, a genetically altered adenovirus. Adenovirus causes the common cold and it's genetically altered so it can't replicate completely. So it starts to replicate which stimulates the immune system to see an invader and it mobilizes the immune system. And then it presents the, um, the antigen, the, the coronavirus uh, spike protein antigen to the immune system, which, which recognizes it with much greater fidelity and efficiency because of this um, a non-replicating vector. So that's a completely different kind of vaccine. It's a great modern technology. It works great. And it has the big advantage of only needing one shot. So it's much more convenient. So if you get the opportunity to get vaccinated, go get vaccinated. And I, I don't even care what vaccine it is because you're going to be protected. Excellent. Now, the variants, the variants are another story, Eric. So really great news. Um, the UK variant, which seems to be more infectious than the old Wuhan Italy, Italian New York variant that we developed vaccine against uh, is still protected uh, by the vaccine. So the mutation in the UK variant does not distort the um, presentation, the architecture of the spike protein antigens. So that's great news. Um, the South African, not so great news. It, it, the vaccine is less effective at protecting you if you get infected with a South African variant. And that's why Moderna and Pfizer have developed a new vaccine against the South African variant. And the Moderna is going into clinical trials in South Africa, I think day after tomorrow, sometime this week. So um, they will be testing this for safety and efficacy. It's gonna be just as safe. It's gonna be just as good as the other one. And then we're probably going to end up with a vaccine that is bivalent. What I mean by that is it's two vaccines instead of one, but mixed in the same vial. And uh, the old polio vaccine uh, was trivalent all the way back to Jonas Salk, 1954. That was 1953. That was trivalent because you have polio virus type one, type two, type three. And the human papillomavirus vaccine is nonovalent. There are nine different uh, papillomavirus types in that vi vaccine. And our yearly flu vaccine used to be trivalent, now it's quadrivalent. So we're used to this. It's easy to mix different, uh, different types of the same kind of related virus into the same vial and to make sure that you're vaccinated against both strains. So wait a few months and Moderna is gonna put that vaccine out. So I'm not, I'm not paralyzed with fear lying in my bed about these, these, uh, these variants. I think that the biotech industry vaccine industry is going to keep up with the variants and they're going to you know the vaccines are going to be more expensive because now you've got a two rather than one and uh, the way to really get rid of these variants is to control global coronavirus circulation of the novel coronavirus so as soon as we can we need to start getting vaccines out to the low and middle income countries we need to establish uh, strong foreign aid strategies to try to wipe out the vaccine globally. It's a little distraction for this group, but I can't resist saying that when we wiped out smallpox from the face of the earth, first we wiped it out in the Americas and then we wiped it out in the rest of the world. And it was wiped out in Africa last, um, in Somalia actually. It cost us about $300 million of 1960s money to wipe off out smallpox from the face of the globe. It saved us a billion dollars a year in smallpox vaccine costs in the U.S. 
talk about a return on investment. Oh, my goodness. So uh, 300 million to wipe it off the face of the planet, and it saved us a billion a year. And with Ebola, we spent 300 million helping the three small countries of West Africa control Ebola back in 2014, 2015. But we spent $2 billion preparing for Ebola to come to the U.S., and we had six cases come to the U.S. So it's much more efficient to go out and control these diseases at their source, where they emerge. Sink your big bucks to do that. So we need global control, and then the, va the variants will go away. The variants only occur in people who have the, vac the virus replicating in their bodies. Those, those replication errors of the RNA vac virus are what uh, uh, is how the variants emerge. So I think we're hearing that the arts are going to come back to life the sooner we can get people. That's I'm saying person-person person art. That's the correct. sooner we can get people engaged. And let's, in let's, think, let's think about the public health community and the arts community um, morphing our relationship from my trying to be helpful to you and you educating me about the arts and what all your complexities are. And that's been very worthwhile and important. But let's think about a grand alliance of how the arts community in the state of Connecticut can join the vaccine confidence movement and try to um, incentivize and urge our own patrons and our own constituents to get vaccinated at high rates, because that's the best ticket for the arts to return to normal. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and already um, some of your, um, uh, we've heard from our or organizations that we've had the pleasure of having you talk specifically uh, to, whether it's via Zoom or, or in, in person, with your confidence videos that they've sent out to their, their public. It's on a smaller scale than what you're talking about, but it's those pockets of, of the public who are, are feeling so much more confident about where we're headed. So again, as if we can't say thanks enough, this is great, but let's, let's all think absolutely right down that line. We have a couple of questions. Um, uh, Becky, I think I'm gonna come back to you here in a bit. Uh, but Judith, um, from Five Points Visual Arts Center up in Torrington. Would you, um, would you like to share the questions you have? Yeah, thank you, Stan, and thank you, everyone. It's great to see everyone. Uh, as you probably all know, we've been given sort of a green light to reopen, to plan about reopening. And so we are here at the Art Center planning to reopen indoors as well as outdoor. Can you give us some advice as to uh, how we can help our, our, our customers and our clients have confidence in what we're trying to do by opening indoor. Um, that's great, Judith. And I'm really excited to hear that you're going to be uh, opening up. Uh, I hope to come to visit you one of these days. Right. Um, we um, have seen uh, uh, folks open up uh, at, uh, according to the governor's guidelines and uh, their folks who've been, who've never, who, and open up for months. So it's very, very plausible that one can open safely. And it's the same old guide guidelines, uh, except it's even, even, you can open up even more confidently because, you know, 20% of you, the, your visitors are going to be vaccinated and then it's going to be 25% and then it's going to be 30%. So each, each person walking in the door is, is, is probabilistically less risky than they were a few months ago. And the rates are dropping, so it, it, it's going well. I think with physical distancing, uh, with masking, with having the the hand uh, sanitizers available, having small groups, you know, um, uh, if if people are, are are doing art, they can have a smaller group. If they are learning about art, they can have a smaller group. The docents can take smaller groups around that are more physically distanced. Um, I've been impressed with what I saw Lawrence Griswold Museum doing. They, I, 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 I joked with them that they were too cautious. I, I thought they were, you know, they were, they were taking more precautions than I would have. But uh, uh, I, I do think that we can return to some semblance of normality, just as some of our sister arts organizations have done. Now, the devil's in the detail. Of what exactly are you doing? What exactly is your is your activity? And uh, I think these webinars have empowered you to make some of those decisions. But if you've got specific uh, questions, I'm, I'm always available, Eric. And we're so Sten, uh, actually, I'm, I'm just reading our, our chat and our Q&A. And folks, if you could use the Q&A, that'd be really helpful because then we can check off your, 
your questions. Um, but we we have uh, several questions. Maybe it's because of all all the talk about singing. But we have several questions about when we think um, that choruses can get back together. Uh, should they begin thinking about it? Can they start rehearsing together? What are your thoughts about this this whole vocal music world? I think that um, singing, wind instruments, um, brass instruments, three of the theoretical big offenders in the music world, since aerosolization is part of the musical process. Um, I love outdoors. I mean, I just love outdoors. You can do so much outdoors and you can do it so safely. So um, uh, at the end of the day, uh, outdoors is going to really make a big difference. Um, if you have uh, vaccinated individuals, they don't have to worry at all. Um, and, uh, you know, performers, uh, people in the audience. And the folks who are not vaccinated yet, um, having the physical distancing, we've been using 12 feet as a guideline for singing and, uh, and wind and brass instruments. And if you can manage a sort of a decompressed group, maybe a smaller group than you might have had, uh, if you've got a chorus, maybe you split them into two and you do chorus uh, rehearsals uh, half the number each time. Uh, maybe you have a concert that is a, a, a smaller, smaller group of performers. And once people are vaccinated, uh, you're in great shape. So I love outdoors. Indoors, we can do an awful lot. Keep in mind, you know, I, I went to um, uh, a concert where they had single seating separated by six feet. And I chatted with the proprietor and said, you know, you can cluster your family groups. You don't have to have each individual because if they're home, to, four people home together, they can sit together and then go six feet away from that clustered group. And I think everybody on this call appreciates that that is going to increase the number of people that you can accommodate in an indoor setting. And, uh, you know, indoors can be mimicking outdoors, uh, either through the optimization of the HVAC systems, heating, ventilation, air conditioning that many of you have done, or through getting your windows open, getting your box fans in your windows and being able to to um, have extremely high air exchange when the outdoor air is, is sympathetic from a temperature point of view. So I think we can uh, start now. We still have the governor's guidelines uh, that we'd like to adhere to, that we're, that we're asked to adhere to, um, but I think we can uh, restore a level of safety. And it's good to walk before, you know, to, to crawl before we walk and walk before we run. So it's not a terrible thing to open up in a decompressed, safe way and then be prepared to ramp up as, as time goes on. Absolutely. Well, um, thank you so much. Uh, th this is, it's helping us all, I think, think about what we should be doing this summer. Obviously the weather's in our favor as we move forward here. Um, uh, it sounds like the message is really, uh, let's continue to think about where, where we can start and that's outdoors and then, and then think about indoors uh, as we are more and more vaccinated. Um, Darren uh, from Flock Theater, did we hit on all your questions in your list from outdoors or do you have any others you'd like to add? I've got a couple other and some of them I was uh, reading in the various chats as well in right. terms of outdoor performance. Just in terms of going over protocol, if you're doing like a roving performance, in different places? Are there suggestions for keeping audience separate or apart? And also, uh, as audience comes in with, um, you know, sitting in groups, if they're bringing their own lawn chairs, uh, are, is there suggestions and protocol for outdoor audience and performer uh, relationship? To be cautious, I see no harm in trying to maintain a 12 foot distancing between the performers and the audience. Why not? Why not? Most of us can do it, especially outdoors. So, so I prefer a little buffer because my performance, my performers are projecting. They're projecting their voices. The dancers are projecting their spit. They don't mean to, but that's just the nature. Um, the, the, the musicians are projecting. Now, you know, 
the the drummers and the violinists maybe not so much but certainly the certainly the um the percussion uh, the the brass and the woodwinds so i think a little bit of distancing a lot of people are saying let's get all our performers tested um two or three days before rehearsals begin and that way we can extract the trombone player who's an asymptomatic carrier and he doesn't participate and um and um and and you know do your best to bring together a performing group that uh, at a at a point in time was judged uh, virus free to minimize the sort of analogous to testing students returning to Yale uh, the week before they come back so that you minimize the asymptomatic carrier walking into your performing group. And then you may be able to get away with six foot distancing there, but you're not having all your, your, your people in the, your audience tested. And so I think that, that having the six foot distancing on the stage still makes sense. Now, as soon as somebody's vaccinated, the need for them to be distanced goes down to zero. And they are um, not going to get ill. And the more, the more days that go by, the more data are coming in suggesting they're also not gonna be infectious to others. Uh, you may have seen Rochelle Walensky, uh, whom I've known for 25 years, very capable individual as the new director of our CDC. She, she said on a webinar just the other day, we don't have the full data yet. And she's right, because she's a government official and she has to be very cautious with what she has to say. But I work for a private university. I can say whatever I want. And I'm telling you the likelihood of a vaccine being as infectious to others as they were before they got vaccinated is exceedingly low. And I think that that's true for, for nearly all the, the, the respiratory viruses, that, that once you're vaccinated, not only are you protected, but you're also much less infectious to others. So I think that, that you're, 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 you're much less a menace to others. And, you know, violinists can wear masks. And, you know, I mean, people who can wear masks are great. And people can use, you can use uh, the, the uh, nets on the on the end of their brass or woodwind instruments can use those nets and diminish the amount of of of, of um, uh, material that's coming out and circulating. So there are all sorts of uh, singers can project a little bit away from their audience into into you know into the planets or into a different part of the uh, stage where they're further away. They're all sort. And Darren, you and I talked about this exact subject when I came out and visited you uh, in New London just, what was it, six months ago, we talked about all these different strategies. Absolutely, great, thank you. Darren, any mo any others that you found that we should be addressed? Well, just, uh, just to follow up with that, the, um, you know, in regards to the audience, especially if you're performing out on the lawn, one of the things that we, Sten came up with that we talked about was, getting one of those uh, markers that they do the lines with in sports fields and really delineating uh, bubbles for, for your audience or those separations. And we did that last year and it was highly effective. The audience just naturally gravitated towards uh, self-isolation and it, was, it worked very, very well. So that's the only, the only thing I would follow up in terms of that. Excellent. Great, 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 thank great, you. Great feedback. Thank you. Absolutely. Uh, Judy Dwarin um, wanted to uh, ask a couple questions here. Um, yes. Hi, Sten. Hi, everybody. Hi, um, Judy. Master of the online event. <laughs> <laughs> um, so at the last webinar we had, you know, we were looking at some of the legal side of things, um, which was very helpful and maybe caused some of us um, concerns. So looking at it through the lens of public health, what should an arts leader do if um, staff or teachers or performers don't wanna take the vaccine? That's a tough one. That is really, really, really tough. Um, and it's tough in the health profession too. Um, we've, We've got the Cleveland Clinic and the Mayo Clinic, and they said, if you want to work at our facilities, 
you have to get the um, flu vaccine, otherwise we are not going to retain you as employees. And as private companies, they were able to do that. But um, it's harder to do that if you're at the University of Minnesota or if you're at Ohio State, because those are public institutions. And uh, there are issues of union contracts and there are issues um, the, of, of sort of the balance between individual liberty and social responsibility. It won't come as any surprise to anybody on this call that the dean of a school of public health is a little bit biased towards the social responsibility side because I'm trying to control disease and disability in our society. So I don't think that a school cafeteria should be allowed to serve fattening and unsafe foods to our children. I think it should be forbidden. So there I'm, I'm more on the social responsibility side to try to, try to prevent obesity in children rather the individual liberty side the kid can have mac and cheese, a hot, a fatty hot dog, and, and M and M's for lunch. So you know, I'm gonna, I'm putting my bias out there. I'm putting my my personal perspective out there. But I think that if I'm running a theater, and I have a variety of artists, I would rather um, get the artists who are willing to cooperate with me. And part of that cooperation is to restore consumer confidence in my product. And part of that is to say that all of the staff and all of the performers are vaccinated against coronavirus. Then I can get up on stage and I can tell my audience this and start to return consumer confidence. Now, if that sounds harsh, I'm sorry, but that is what I think I would do if I were one of you. Mm -hmm. um, now, if we're talking about the New Haven Symphony Orchestra and you're talking about a hundred different people, you know, um, are you going to settle for herd immunity or are you going to settle for 90% of them being vaccinated? You're going to say that's good enough. The probability is limited that we'll have circulation within the orchestra members. That's a decision you all are going to have to make. But I, I would like to strive for 100% coverage of vaccine for um, my performers and my employees. And I'm going to use that for my marketing to restore confidence in my product and start getting back to normal. And it's an important part of my business decision. Um, and I think it's the right thing to do out of respect for my, for my patrons. I'm a doctor, I'm a pediatrician, I go see kids. It would never occur to me not to be vaccinated against influenza. Why do I wanna be a nidus of infection to one of my immune suppressed patients? That would be the height of irresponsibility. And I don't think you should go to medical clinics that don't va vaccinate all their staff against influenza. How could that possibly be responsible? And let, let's be honest, the arts are a public facing entity. Just like medicine, you are in touch with the public. You are facing the public. You are exposing to the public whatever you might be carrying into the theater. So I'm a militant on this, and forgive me for those of you who disagree. No. You're, 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 you have every right to disagree with what I've just said, because I am taking an extreme view. But I think it's the right thing to do. No, I, I think that's very helpful to hear, hear it and to know, honestly, that that is your position. Um, as an artist, um, how does one determine whether to go into a venue or not. So that, um, yeah, what would be the way to determine that I'm, I feel safe to go into this venue and work? Yeah, I think that's a great question. If, um, if, if I get a call that, that, that you know, there's, a, there's an opportunity, I would like to ask uh, the um, meeting organizer about coronavirus precautions and see what they have to say. If they do a lot of mumbling and bumbling, indicating that they really haven't thought much about it, I'm not sure that's the venue I'm, I'm eagerly seeking. Uh, I would really love to have a coherent narrative saying, we've thought about that. We've uh, attended webinars to learn about that. We've read the governor's guidance. We've um, 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 trained our staff. We've uh, adjusted our... Um, our uh, coffee and snack service. We've adjusted our 
ticket buying strategy. We've adjusted how people are going to enter the theater. We've adjusted how people are going to be seated in the theater. We've adjusted, we've made our green room safe and our changing room safe, and we've tried to accommodate uh, um, uh, physical distancing as best we can. And we're going to be making the hand hygiene available, and we're going to be requiring the audience and the employees to wear masks. And we're going to test you um, three days before, um, two days, three days before rehearsals start to make sure that all of you are uh, coronavirus free at that time. Can we promise you that you won't that your your risk is zero? No, we can't promise that your risk is zero. But we're doing everything that we can to keep you safe. That's what I would like to hear if I were a performer. That's so helpful. I mean, this if you just go through the chat and go through the Q and A, I mean, you've just really helped so many people um, with this tough decision. I'm sure it's going to be a, a decision that we're we're going to be all faced with for the next. Well, you know, well, you know, yeah. you, you know, you know what we pediatricians and uh, and teachers and parents always say: tough love. <laughs> this is all coming from love. That's this right. is all coming from wanting to keep our performers safe, our employees safe, and our patrons safe. It's all Absolutely. love. Absolutely. It sounds so, aggressive, uh, but it's tough love. <laughs> no, that's that's right on. So, um, Becky with the Florence Griswold uh, Museum and. Historic House, we'd love to get a couple of questions from you here. Thanks, good to see you, Sten. Um, Always a pleasure, Becky. We have benefited so much from your knowledge over the past year and, and today. And I uh, just wanted to ask a couple questions and I'm gonna hop back to one of our, our biggest fixations right now, which is the vaccine. Um, so just talking through a little devil's advocate questions, which we all get as leaders in our own organizations, how long do we expect the vaccine to actually last? Is this an annual thing we should be prepared for, like the flu vaccine? Really good news, Becky, really good news. So there's a paper came out, New England Journal of Medicine just recently, which for those of you who don't know, that's like the prestige journal in medicine from the scientists in Wuhan, China. And they did a very careful and very well done study following a large number of infected persons. People who got infected in the month of December and January in Wuhan, China, which is where the first cases came. And they followed them for eight months. And the antibodies to the virus had not waned at all in eight months. And guess what? The vaccine-induced immunity is as good or maybe a little better than natural infection, which, by the way, is very rare. It just shows you how fantastic these vaccines are, because most other vaccines, that's not true. Natural infection protects you from subsequent infection better, assuming you survive, better than, 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 than vaccine-induced protection. So if, if the antibodies are not waning in eight months at all, that means that um, we're probably looking at a few years of protection rather than a few months of protection. So what's more likely to be the case is that we maybe we'll need a, a vaccine booster every three years, something along those lines. I'm guessing, but I think it's a reasonable guess. And I, th I think most coronavirus vaccinologists would agree with me. That's a good guess. Now, in terms of a new vaccine every year, that'll depend upon how quickly some of these uh, uncooperative variants enter the U.S. and start to circulate. So the U.K. variant was very cooperative. It, 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 it decided to not change the uh, spike protein very much so that the vaccine still works. But the South African variant was not very cooperative, and it, it distorted the architecture of the spike protein such that the vaccine is a little less effective. And so Moderna is starting its vaccine trial of their new vaccine against the South African variant. They developed it in like two months and they uh, manufactured it. And now they're starting the small safety trials in South Africa. And uh, they will be ramping up uh, to the full scale trials in the very near future. So stay tuned. It may be that we will get a uh, bivalent vaccine. What do I mean by that? The old polio vaccine had three different vaccine vaccines in one. 
because there are three different types of polio vaccine. The, the human papillomavirus vaccine that we give to all our teenagers is non-avalent. It has nine different types of papillomavirus in it. The flu vaccine you get every year used to be trivalent. Now it's quadrivalent. And so it may be that the future coronaviruses will be bi bivalent or maybe even trivalent. But the biotech industry knows what it's doing and the vaccine industry, and they're keeping up with these variants. Our job is sort of what I said earlier. We need to wipe out coronavirus from all the countries of the world so we don't produce more variants. And, uh, and that, that's our challenge. It's really interesting and, and heartening to hear. It is heartening, yeah. Um, following up on one of the questions that I've heard a lot about too is that we don't know that much about long-term side effects. And there are lots of questions about that. Looking particularly at the issue of fertility, are there concerns for our youth in terms of fertility uh, considerations? And similarly, what do we know about pregnant women getting the vaccine? Do they or don't they? Yeah, the, the, whole, the whole issue of uh, pregnancy and risk kind of emerges from uh, something that's true and something that's false. The true thing is that we do not want to give pregnant women live attenuated vaccines. So uh, we would rather you not be pregnant anymore before we give you your small, uh, your, your um, yellow fever vaccine or your Amazon jungle ecotourism. Um, uh, and we would rather not give you your measles, mumps, rubella vaccine while you're in your first trimester of pregnancy. Not because we think it's gonna do the fetus any harm, but because theoretically giving you a living virus is just not a good idea when you're pregnant even if it's, if it's weakened, which is attenuated, we call them attenuated vaccines, weakened vaccine, a weakened virus. So the, the, th that is true, but these are, this is an mRNA vaccine and the J&J uh, &J is, uh, is a non-replicating um, uh, adenovirus, which is a cold virus. It can't continue its replication cycle. All it does is start replicating, stimulate immune response, and then the immune system sees the little spike protein antigen that's nested within the vaccine. So there is no conceivable harm that these vaccines could do to a pregnant woman, and certainly not to fertility. Um, but there has been a global rumor mill around vaccines in pregnancy. For example, when we were trying to eradicate polio from northern Nigeria, the rumor mill was that the Christian Nigerians were trying to sterilize the Muslim Nigerians by giving all the baby, girls, and boys vaccine. And the same exact rumor in Bihar state of India, when we were trying to get rid of polio there, uh, except this time it was the, it was the Hindu uh, Indians trying to sterilize the Muslim Indians. So there's this circulating rumor around the world that vaccines are somehow a way of, of genocidal control of people's fertility. And I think that you mix that with the um, truth which is that we are reluctant to vaccinate pregnant women with live attenuated vaccines. And then somehow people think, well, vaccines harm fertility, which is not true. There are no vaccines to our knowledge that harm fertility at all in any way. And least of all, this highly purified, highly specific spike protein based vaccine. There's no cross reacting antigen between this vaccine and anything on a gamete or anything in the, in the, in the, in the, um, in the reproductive system. So I would give my 16-year-old um, daughter, if I had one, the vaccine in a heartbeat. If I were a 16-year-old young woman, I would take it in a heartbeat. Okay, well, thank you, Stan. This is, uh, it has just hit 11 o'clock. So I'm sure you probably need to be on another call at this very moment. <laughs> so I wanna say thank you to everybody. Um, there's a, bajillion questions uh, in the chat, et cetera. We, 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 uh, as we do in the past, Eric, we'll harvest those questions, That's we'll right. systematically answer them and put them on your website. Yeah, we'll just- And I, we'll, and I, and I am going to have to go, so yeah, thanks so for your thank time. Thank you, Stan. Uh, okay, we, we appreciate bye -bye. it. Again, I want to thank our wonderful task force for all that you all do. Um, thank you for, uh, for um, leading the charge with us, uh, uh, us, us here. Let's listen to what Stan had to say and, um, and take it out into the community and help all of our our fellow arts leaders with this. 
we are, um, as he mentioned, we're trying to figure out how best to leverage this humongous community we've built through this webinar series. So I really look forward to hearing from you all. Don't hesitate, send me a note in the next 10 minutes uh, at eric at shorelinearts.org and say, here, this is what we need. Um, because we really are nimble. We wanna make sure that we're answering all that we can for you. If you didn't feel your question was answered exactly, please um, send it again. And, and like he said, I'll, I spend, I'll spend time with he and Crystal and his team trying to um, get these questions answered. They probably won't come back directly to you. It just means you gotta keep checking back uh, with us. So um, thank you all so much. Have a great day. Enjoy the beautiful sun and hope to see you soon. Take care. Bye-bye.